Dr. Gooden here with the first lecture for 3025, Structural Kinesiology. And this, in this lecture, we're going to cover some of the background information for the trunk and spinal column. Now, all of this info comes from Chapter 12 or Chapter 11, if you're in a newer version, of the Manual of Structural Kinesiology by R.T. Floyd. Some of it's been adapted, adapted by me, um, but let's get going. All right, so your vertebral column, it is made up of 24 intricate and complex articulating freely movable vertebrae. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves as well. We don't need to know those for this course. Uh, we'll be focused on the bony and muscular structures. This is also where we have the abdominal muscles. So some of these muscles are linked by fascia and tendinous bands instead of by bone. Most muscles attach from bone to bone, but not all of your abdominal muscles do. You have many small intrinsic muscles as well as larger ones that act on the head, vertebral column, and thorax. And we are going to go through those muscles together. And these assist in spinal stabilization, in respiration, and some of them are too deep to palpate. So we're not gonna palpate all of these muscles as we will in some of the other sections of this course. But first, just a review of the vertebral column. So we have seven cervical vertebrae, you can see up there. And those are the, that's in your neck, they're the smallest vertebrae. They don't have to carry that heavy of a load, except for those of us like me with a big head. And then we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, limited in movement compared to the cervical and lumbar region at least. The five lumbar vertebrae, now all of these are freely movable. They can articulate um, ever so slightly with the vertebrae above and below, but all of that articulation put together yields a, a large range of motion if we consider the spine as a whole. And then we have our five fused sacrum, which are way down here. And then finally, the coccyx or tailbone, right down there at the bottom. Now the first two cervical vertebrae, um, the atlas and the axis, these have different shapes. So their shapes allow for extensive rotary movement, as well as forward and backward movement, flexion and extension of the head. And we'll look at those in a little bit. Now, the bones in your spine have three normal curves in a movable spine. The way that your spine should curve is, let's, let me just draw it here, here's our man. We have the thoracic, uh, sorry, the cervical region, the thoracic region, and the lumbar region. So we have this sort of um, almost one and a half S curves that helps us to absorb blows and shocks. So the cervical and lumbar spine are curving posteriorly. Well, maybe, yeah, that's the way that the C or the, the curve is facing. And then the thoracic region, the curve is facing forward anteriorly. And these vertebrae decrease, uh, increase in size from top to bottom. So these guys are small up top, but they get progressively larger as we get down to the bottom. Oops, maybe I should continue drawing that all the way down. Now, I mentioned that the first two cervical vertebrae are called the atlas and the axis, and these are different in shape from the rest, from C2 through L5. The vertebrae are named using um, the first letter of the region, so C for cervical or L for lumbar, and then the number according to whatever number of vertebrae it is from top to bottom, from superior to inferior. But we call the atlas and the axis uh, by different names. Now, they are comprised of a body, which is on the anterior aspect, the central vertebral foramen, which is where the spinal cord runs through, that's on the posterior aspect, transverse processes that spout off on either side, and a spinous process, which you can uh, pretty easily palpate, especially for C7. Now here are the atlas and the axis. <clears throat> so the atlas is up top, it's right here, and we can see on the um, atlas, we have these superior articular facets that articulate with the occipital surface of your skull, and this allows for capital flexion and extension. When I say capital, I'm referring to the head, like the capital of a country or of a state is the head of that country or state, so um, capital flexion and extension. Typically, when we see capital flexion and extension, we don't differentiate it from cervical flexion and extension, but more on that later. Now here is the vertebral foramen. It looks really big. That's just because this atlas is fairly small compared to some of the other vertebrae that you'll see. Here's the axis, and this um, dens right here, It's you'll see it in a later picture. It's like an upward projecting spire, kind of, uh, 
and it allows the atlas to rotate around it on the axis, like an axis of rotation. Now you can remember Atlas, because in Greek mythology, Atlas is the guy holding the world on his back or on his shoulders, and your Atlas holds your own head, which is kind of where we live. Um, our senses and our thoughts are all in our head. Uh, it holds your own head on your shoulders. And then the axis is the axis around which that head can rotate. Now, the cervical vertebrae, these are smaller than, th than the thoracic and the lumbar vertebrae. Here's the body right here. We have the vertebral foramen in the center where the spinal cord goes. These lamina are like bridges between the spinous process and the um, superior and inferior articular facets. This is where this vertebrae would articulate with the vertebrae above and below. Um, moving on to the thoracic vertebrae, you can see it's getting larger relative to the vertebral foramen. Again, we have the spinous process. Now we have these transverse processes, and this is where we are going to have articulations with the tubercles of your ribs. Again, the superior and inferior articular facets. Oops, this one is that I'm coloring right now. That's for the um, rib, the superior costal facet. And let's see, over here is a superior articular facet that articulates with the vertebrae above it. And you'll notice that on these um, thoracic vertebrae, the spinous process is now pointed downwards or caudally. Unlike the cervical vertebrae, it's, it's kind of pointed straight back, not so much down. Okay, and then the lumbar vertebrae, the largest body of all of them, because it has to bear all of that load. This allows for more shock absorption. We have the spine, of course the lamina again. Here's the superior articular process, transverse process right here. And again, the inferior articular process. All right, so some f familiar structures on all of these. You should be able to see any one of these uh, bony structures in person and be able to tell, oh, that's a cervical vertebrae, that's a thoracic vertebrae or a lumbar vertebrae. Now I mentioned those curves, those normal curves, and just to draw it again for you, this is what it should look like. Okay, there we go. So this is the cervical region at the top, putting it this way, thoracic region and lumbar region. Now that's what it should look like, but if we have a lordosis, this top one right here, this is an increased posterior concavity of the lumbar and cervical curves. So lord, a lordosis, let's imagine that this guy's hips are right here, and let's say that they're level. I'm just going to draw a triangle for the hips. Um, a lordosis is going to look something like this. So you're going to have this extreme curve, and then another extreme curve. You can have a lordosis of the cervical spine or of the lumbar spine. I drew it with both. And then this is going to set your hips up so that they are tilted anteriorly. See how they're rotated that way. And we can imagine what that's going to do to the kinetic chain, which we'll learn about later. But imagine if you will, if you had some legs, and maybe this is a knee, and maybe you have some muscles on the backside that are now tight, and maybe some muscles on the front side that are now short, and that's gonna mess some things up. So that's called the lordosis. A kyphosis is the opposite of that. That's more of a flat back. A posture, I'll draw it on the other side. So that's going to be maybe kind of no curve. And maybe the hips are now kind of slouched forward a little bit. Draw a bigger triangle. They're slouched forward a little bit. And this that could be due to um, a number of other muscular problems or contribute to them as well. Scoliosis is a lateral curvature. So now we have this anterior view and maybe there's some kind of curvature like that. Okay, and that would be scoliosis. Okay, so I mentioned that in the thoracic region you have ribs that are articulating with your vertebrae. The ribs also articulate with the sternum, which is composed of the manubrium and the body, the sternum and the xiphoid process. Now we have seven pairs of true ribs. They're called true ribs because they attach directly to the sternum. So you can see them numbered over here down to seven. And notice how they all are attaching 
directly to the sternum, all the way up. But these um, false ribs, let's see, eight, nine, and 10, um, these are attaching indirectly to the sternum. So they have to go through the other um, costal cartilages of these other ribs to attach to the sternum. And then you have two pairs of floating ribs, 11 and 12, down on the bottom, and they're just danglers. They're just down there, not attached to the sternum. Now remember that they are articulating at this facet right here. And this is the tubercle of the rib of the rib that is that is articulating. And then the head of the rib also articulates. Okay, we call this the shaft, this long part. And then the sternal end is that part that articulates with the sternum. Okay, now uh, to talk more about the joints, remember I mentioned that the dens is kind of like an upward spire right there. Um, right there. So the first joint though, actually to talk about, I don't want to get ahead of myself, is the atlanto-occipital joint. And remember we have these, this is the first joint formed by the occipital condyles of the skull sitting on the articula, um, oops, articular fossa of the first vertebrae. Ah, shoot, sorry. Okay, and this allows for flexion and extension of the head. And then with the atlas sitting on top of the axis, so remember this is the atlas, this is the axis, we have the atlantoaxial joint, and this is where most of your cervical rotation occurs. So this atlas can rotate either way around the dens, around this guy right here, um, on top of the axis, and that's the atlantoaxial joint. It's the most mobile joint of any two vertebrae. Now the rest of your vertebrae have this limited gliding type of movement at their articular facets. So here's, um, you know, here's an inferior and a superior articular process, and you can see how we have this gliding type movement between them, and it's very limited. But when you, you know, when you combine all of your vertebrae together, it results in large ranges of motion. Now the other place that your vertebrae articulate with each other um, are at these discs, the intervertebral discs. Now these are between and adhering to the articular cartilage of the vertebral bodies. The outer rim right here is called the annulus fibrosus. This is um, a dense, uh, sort of thick and fibrous outer um, protective covering. And it's surrounding this gelatinous nucleus pulposus that is um, kind of like a squishy sh shock absorber, kind of like um, if you've ever seen someone wear um, Nike Airs or something where they have in the heel that, that little cushion, um, that's what it reminds me of. Or you can think of a jelly donut, right, where the jelly's on the inside and it's squishy and it's wanting to squirt out if you squeeze that donut. And this compressed elastic material allows for compression. It's like a, your own shock absorber in the spine. You can imagine that as you're walking, running, jostling, lifting heavy things, um, that there's a lot of forces that act on your spinal column. And this shock absorber um, helps you to um, prevent damage not only to your vertebrae, but also to the spinal cord. Now, unfortunately, over time, oops, over time, either due to chronic uh, repeated stresses or some sort of traumatic stress, you can get what's called a herniated disc. And this is where the annulus fibrosis kind of breaks down and it allows the nucleus pulposus to sort of jet out on and putting pressure on the spinal cord and the nerve root. This nerve root, if it gets pressure put on it, maybe it leads to tingly sensations, burning sensations, uh, weakness in the limb that it's innervating, and that's no bueno. Okay, that wraps up the overview for the trunk and spinal column. The next video will go over key bony landmarks for this region, and then the third video will go over the musculature and their actions.